In the second part of this video, we'll go over the uh, cytoplasmic organelles, the small organelles that are located inside of the cell. As you see here in the picture, we'll go through each one of these and uh, kind of talk about each one individually. Uh, this will be a good place to make some flashcards on each one of the structures so that you can kind of uh, have a way to study you know, what the structure is and the main function. So the first structure we'll look at is the mitochondria. If you've had some basic biology before, you're probably are familiar with mitochondria. This is the location of um, where ATP synthesis takes place, and you'll be talking about um, ATP synthesis, cell, re uh, cell respiration, uh, when you get to 169. But it is a double membrane structure, and there's two separate membranes. There's um, an outer membrane you can kind of see in the diagram here, and then it has a special inner membrane which is where most of the ATP production takes place. <clears throat> and that inner membrane uh, has inner foldings there that are called Christi. And the other interesting thing about mitochondria is that it does contain its own DNA. And so it has a small genetic um, genome there with its own genes, and so it is self-replicating. It can divide on its own. Uh, another uh, organelle is a peroxisome. This is a type of storage vesicle or container inside of cells that usually contains some types of enzymes um, that help to digest different substances. So some peroxisomes help to digest things like lipids or fatty acids and uh, amino acids. And uh, some peroxisomes will have an enzyme called catalase. Catalase is important because that is needed to break down hydrogen peroxide. And they also seem to help to synthesize the production of phospholipids. <clears throat> ribosomes, you may remember if you've had some biology before, ribosomes, the main function here is protein synthesis. Uh, that's also referred to as translation. We'll talk briefly about translation uh, later in the chapter. But protein synthesis or translation or making proteins, that takes place uh, in the ribosomes. The ribosomes are in the cytoplasm of the cell. Some ribosomes are free. In other words, they're, they're not attached to anything. They're just kind of free, um, suspended out in the cytoplasm. And then other ribosomes are attached to another organelle, which we'll talk about, called the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is, um, is a series of membranes. It is directly connected to the, uh, to the nucleus through the nuclear envelope or the membrane around the nucleus. And there are two types of endoplasmic reticulum depending on whether or not they have ribosomes. And so if the endo re endoplasmic reticulum is associated with ribosomes, if the ribosomes are attached there, then it's referred to as rough just because it gives the endoplasmic reticulum kind of a rough appearance. Um, and so if it has ribosomes, remember, then it produces proteins. That's its main functions. And so the endoplasmic reticulum, this membrane structure, if it has ribosomes, it'll produce proteins. And then it helps to fold or kind of modify the proteins to have them kind of finalized and developed. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum doesn't have any ribosomes, and so it's not manufacturing any proteins, but it does manufacture lipids. So here's kind of a diagram of uh, some of the membrane structure here. The little small picture shows you uh, the entire cell. The inner portion would be the nucleus, and so the nucleus, uh, the membrane around the nucleus is continuous with the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. You see the little, little small dots here that represents ribosomes. Those ribosomes here would be attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and so that would mean that this is rough, uh, and so this portion of the endoplasmic reticulum <clears throat> would be producing proteins, whereas this portion of the endoplasmic reticulum is smooth, there's no ribosomes, and so it's not producing proteins, but it, instead it would be producing some lipids. Another membrane structure that you'll find in a cell is also called the Golgi apparatus. Sometimes you see this called the Golgi body. It's a flattened type of membrane system, and it's really where um, substances, chemicals, proteins, lipids in the, in the cell um, get kind of packaged or modified again. Um, a lot of times they are, uh, the chemicals would go through this membrane structure, and then they are basically put inside of little vesicles uh, storage vesicles, so sometimes they are stored inside of the cell. It's like packaging them up into a vesicle or storage site. And then sometimes they are secreted. So if a cell is a gland cell, 
it may be secreting some substance uh, to the outside of the cell. And it could do this by putting that, that substance, that chemical, or maybe an enzyme or hormone or something inside of one of these little storage vesicles. And it uh, fuses with the cell membrane and this then allows it to secrete that substance on the outside of the cell. Another organelle is called a lysosome. Um, this uh, is similar to a peroxisome because it does contain digestive enzymes. And so it's a storage vesicle, basically there for uh, storing up enzymes. And many times these enzymes are used whenever the cell may take in something to, that it needs to break down or digest. So for example, white blood cell. Your immune system has white blood cells and many times they're gonna go around and engulf or endocytose some type of uh, maybe bacteria or you know, foreign cell or dead cell. Um, and then you have to have some way to digest that cell, you know, that cell or that bacteria once it's inside the white blood cell. And so you would have lysosomes there storing up some enzymes, try to break down you know, whatever that cell takes into. Now, um, section five talks uh, about the cytoskeleton. Um, your cells have a skeleton. Uh, it's not like your, your bone skeleton or anything, but it is a structurally uh, way that you're, you have support inside of the cell. And so we'll be talking about the proteins. You see on the diagram here, there's three main types of protein and different types of structures that these proteins make up in order to form that cytoskeleton. Now, the cytoskeleton does uh, support the cell just like our, our skeleton supports our body and allows for the cell to move still. And so we'll talk briefly about three main types that make up the cytoskeleton, the actin filaments, the intermediate filaments, and the microtubules. And so I have a list on the next slide here, uh, the actin filaments. Sometimes you see these called microfilaments. These are the smallest of the three, smallest of the three filaments, and they're basically two, um, two strands of actin protein uh, wrapped together like a helix. And so uh, these functions for that are basically structural support. They're, they're trying to help the cell have the, the shape that it has and provide the necessary tension inside, inside of the cell. Um, uh, actin, whenever it is combined with another protein called myosin, helps in movement. So this actual, this uh, microfilament can actually help in, in movement. We'll see this later on when we get to the muscular system because actin and myosin basically allow for your muscle cells to move. Now the next uh, type of filament is what's called the intermediate filament. It is intermediate in size between um, uh, all three of these and so it's called the intermediate filament. It's more rope-like and so you have multiple strands of a protein called keratin and because they're kind of wrapped together that kind of gives it a, a very strong structural support and again it helps to make up the framework of the cell. So your cells are not just empty bags of cytoplasm and organelles. You actually have this type of framework or scaffolding inside of a cell to try to hold things in place. And so this connects uh, some of the organelles to try to hold them in place. Now the third type of, of filament is called a microtubule. This is the largest and it is a tube. And so uh, a tube is a you know, hollow, hollow rod or tube and you've got different subunits of a protein called tubulin. So each one of these filaments has its own subunit. And so microtubules has something called tubulin, a protein subunit called tubulin, and it can actually change shapes. And so this can get smaller or larger if you need it to. And again, this is there for structural support. Uh, all of these have some bearing on structural support inside of the cell, keeping everything in alignment. Now the next uh, little section talks about some cell extension, some, some, uh, some things, some different um, structures that come out of a cell. And so the first one we'll talk about are something called microvilli. Micro means of course very small. And um, villus here is a finger-like extension. So microvilli are very small finger-like extensions that come out of the cell membrane. So here you have a diagram of a cell and you actually have a real um, microscope image of the microvilli uh, to the right. And you see these are very long uh, finger-like pro projections that come out of the cell. Uh, 
um, usually you see that these help to increase the surface area of a cell. So any, anywhere you would see surface area, and we'll talk about these really in 169, you'll talk about places like the digestive system. Inside of the intestines, you find microvilli because you're trying to absorb up a lot of nutrients. And in, um, in the, uh, the urinary system, you see microvilli because you're trying to reabsorb you know, a lot of the, uh, the fluid inside of the uh, renal tubules, inside of the kidneys. And so um, those are two locations that you normally would find microvilli. But the main function here is that they increase the surface area to give you better absorption. Centrioles. This is another uh, type of organelle that you'll find. It's located in a region of a cell known as a centrosome. That's a location, and uh, it's near the nucleus, and they are also made out of microtubules. So this is another function of microtubules is that it forms something called a centriole. Now, the centriole has a specific pattern that, that is common in different places. Um, it's called a 9 plus 3 pattern. So if you look at the diagram in part A here, you have nine, uh, it's like, a, like spokes on a bicycle wheel. You've got nine um, spokes coming out, and each spoke here is gonna have three tubes making up um, that section of that, that, micro, um, that centri centriole. So it's what's called a nine plus three pattern. And you're gonna find these centrioles um, in uh, three different main locations, spindle fibers, cilia, and flagella. Spindle fibers, we'll talk about briefly, because they're part of uh, your cell division. They're part of mitosis. They help connect to chromosomes and help them to kind of move around in the cell during cell division, during mitosis. And then cilia and flagella we'll talk about uh, next. You may have heard of both of these. Cilia, these are very small hair-like projections coming out of a cell, but these are different than the microvilli. These are actually um, made out of microtubules and they actually have some what are called motor proteins that actually help these uh, little microtubules to move. And so cilia move, and usually if a cell has cilia, not all cells are, are gonna have cilia, but if a cell has cilia, it usually has a lot of these, uh, many cilia on a cell. And they all kind of have a sweeping motion and kind of move. And uh, for example, you have cilia in your respiratory tract and that helps to kind of sweep up particles that may get you know, down in your trachea or in your bronchial tubes. It kind of helps sweep up some mucus and other uh, debris that may get into your respiratory tract. So that's cilia. These are made out of microtubules. Flagella are also made out of microtubules. Um, so the structure is the same, but usually a flagellum would be much longer. And usually if a cell has one, not all, again, not all cells have flagella, but if a cell has one, uh, has flagella, then it's usually just one per cell. Now, you, if you take microbiology, you'll talk about how cells, different bacteria may have cilia, some bacteria have flagella, and some bacteria have many flagella all around the bacterial cell. But usually for animal cells, if it has a flagella, it's usually just one. And the example here is a sperm cell. And the flagella allows for movement or locomotion of that cell. All right, section six talks about the nucleus, and um, the nucleus is a membrane-bound organelle. It's got a membrane around it. Sometimes you call, you see that called a nuclear envelope, and that nuclear envelope has openings in it or pores that allow certain things to kind of move in and out of the nucleus, and inside of that um, nucleus, you have another structure called a nucleolus, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the nucleolus. This is where ribosomal RNA is produced, so we'll talk about that. And uh, this is where most of the cell's DNA is located inside the nucleus, but remember, we said that you do have some DNA in your mitochondria organelles as well. So um, also what you'll find in the nucleus would be DNA, and so we'll talk about a few vocabulary words for um, associated with DNA. And so the first one is chromatin. This is basically DNA strands. Um, that have been intertwined with proteins. There's a special type of protein called a histone protein. And so in the diagram, it does a good job of kind of showing you here's your double helix of DNA, and then it kind of gets um, kind of intertwined or, or kind of um, wrapped up with some histone type proteins, and that's further wrapped up to make um, what's called chromatin. Now, once you condense all of that, once you tightly pack it together, 
then you have something called a chromosome. And then this chromosome is joined together. Uh, you basically have a, a chromosome here that has two um, parts to it called a chromatid, two individ individual parts called a chromatid. That chromatid is joined together in the middle. Usually it's in the middle, it can be offset a little bit, um, but it's joined together um, by something called a centromere. And that centromere is holding those two chromatids together. The nucleolus, we kind of mentioned earlier, um, is uh, inside of the nucleus, and this is where the, um, a type of RNA is produced called ribosomal RNA, and ribosomal RNA is necessary to make the ribosomes, and so that's the function of the nucleolus found inside of the nucleus. Now, briefly, I want to mention a few things about protein synthesis. Uh, we're not going to go into this in detail. If you take a general biology class, maybe by 110 or by 111, you'll see this in more detail, but we just want to mention a few of the vocabulary words. Um, first of all, protein synthesis is what it sounds like. It is synthesizing proteins. It uses the genetic information from DNA, and then it's, it transfers that information into uh, another type of nucleic acid called RNA, and that basically um, helps to form the protein the actual process of making the protein is called gene expression. And so you would take a particular gene, a specific gene out of the DNA, and once it is expressed, or that process called gene expression actually produces the protein. There's two main processes. You can see these definitions here, transcription and translation. Transcription is where uh, you're actually making the messenger RNA. You're making the message from the DNA. And I've got a, like a little uh, flow chart up here. Inside the nucleus, you would start out with DNA, you would go through transcription, and it takes the genetic code in the DNA and transcribes it or rewrites it into a different type of a code called RNA. In this case, it's a messenger RNA because it carries a message to make or the blueprint to, to make the protein that you're trying to make. Translation is different because translation is actually protein synthesis. It's actually taking that message and translating it into an amino acid sequence to build a protein. The other thing that's different is the location. Transcription is taking place inside the nucleus, but translation is taking place outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm of the cell. Then in section eight, we'll briefly look at the cell cycle. You may have covered some of this also in some uh, general biology. Cell cycle uh, is basically talking about cell division, although there are two main phases. Interphase is technically when the cell is growing and kind of getting ready for cell division. And then the M phase um, is, or the mitosis phase, is actually the cell division part of the cycle. And so interphase has three main um, periods of growth. There's G1, S, and G2. And G1 is what's called a gap phase. This is where the cell is doing its normal um, activities, uh, metabolic activities. It's producing uh, new organelles. It's producing the cyto cytoskeleton that it needs. It's going through regular me metabolism in that particular G1 phase. S phase, S stands for synthesis. And so S phase is where the DNA uh, synthesis is taking place. DNA replication is taking place. You're going through and copying the DNA, getting it ready for cell division. And then G2, the second gap phase, is a growth phase where the cell is actually growing and it's getting ready. It's going through, um, uh, getting all the proteins necessary ready to go through the cell division process. So this is right before mitosis begins. And so on the uh, little flow chart here, the diagram, figure 3.33, you kind of see um, both of these um, kind of laid out for you. <clears throat> Interphase would be the longest part of a cell cycle, and then you have the M phase or mitosis phase, which is shorter. And you kind of see kind of a synopsis of what's going on. G1 is a growth type phase. S phase is DNA is being replicated or synthesized. And then G2 is another growth phase, getting ready for mitosis. So um, just a um, basic definition of, of mitosis, it is the division of the genetic material. It's, it's taking one cell, one parent cell, and replicating it, dividing it into two equal daughter cells. There are four main uh, stages that 
We'll talk about prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Prophase is the first phase of mitosis, and that is where uh, uh, several things um, happen. You see the chromatin becomes compacted, and it forms the actual chromosomes. It condenses to form a chromosome, and that's where you find the two sister chromatids joined together. The nu nucleolus actually breaks down. It disintegrates. Uh, it, the cell begins to form a spindle fiber, and that's going to help. We'll talk about that. That's going to help to move the chromosomes around inside of the cell. The, um, the spindle fiber comes out and attaches. You can kind of see uh, this. Um, you see the centrioles are starting to move out towards the end of the cell, and the spindle fibers are forming. Eventually, the spindle fibers will attach to the centromere. And then at the end of prophase, the whole nucleus, the nucleus membrane breaks apart. And so now the chromosomes are free to kind of move around inside the cell without the constraints of the nucleus, um, nuclear membrane. In metaphase, this is the second stage and actually the longest stage of the cell cycle or the, of the end phase really. And uh, this is where the chromosomes move to the middle of the cell. They all line up in the middle of the cell. Here you see the, the centrioles, you see the spindle fibers, and the spindle fibers again are connected to the centromere, and it's the spindle fibers that are helping to migrate these chromosomes right in the middle of the cell. Third stage is called anaphase, and the key step here is that those individual chromatids are, are split apart, and because they're connected to those spindle fibers, they're actually pulled to the opposite ends of the cell. And so for us, for humans, we have each cell is going to have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. And so at the end of cell division, you'll still have that same number of 46 chromosomes. Now, there's a process known as cytokinesis. There's still one more phase we need to talk about, but the process of what's called cytokinesis actually begins at this stage. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But the fourth stage is what's called uh, telophase. And telophase is where the two cells are now going to split apart. And so you have cytokinesis, which, which is the division of the cell here and the cytoplasm. And so you have two equal cells forming. The nucleus, remember the nucleus back in prophase had broken down. So in telophase, the nucleus reforms. The nucleolus, that reappears, it reforms. And the chromosomes un uh, uncoil again. Because remember, they in prophase, they had become uh, compacted into chromosomes. Now the chromosomes uncoil and they return to the chromatin state. Cytokinesis basically is where that division takes place. It's dividing the cytoplasm or the cytosol and all the organelles basically equally into two uh, should be identical daughter cells. These should be identical to the parents. The genetic makeup should be identical. Um, these two daughter cells should be identical and they should be identical to the parent cell. Um, that cytokinesis process takes place because you have um, some of the uh, filaments, the protein filaments that we talked about, actin and myosin, and they start kind of tightening up around um, the middle of the cell. Let me go back and kind of show you right there. Uh, they kind of start tightening up around here and that starts to pinch the cell and that's called a cleavage furrow, and that starts to pinch the cell in half until eventually it just divides completely in half. 